Hey everybody, this is Lloyd with Just Got Played, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. This is the core set from the OP games. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do this one solo because I don't think anyone else on the team has had a chance to play this yet. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick overview of the game, and then I'll come back and tell you what I thought, what I liked, what I didn't like. And as always, make sure to like, share, subscribe so it helps us out on the channel and go ahead and join the Discord. Um, come chat with us. The link is in the description. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this game plays. Hey, so this is Disney Sorcerer's Reina Epic Alliances. I'm going to go ahead and go over all of the components real quick and give you a quick overview of how to play. And then we'll head back to hear my thoughts on the game. So just going around the table, um, we have the character uh, cards. We have uh, the rings that you're going to put on your uh, standees. We have the decks of cards for the different characters. Over here, we have the standees and their uh, little uh, turn order markers. Uh, we have some point tokens here. We have the uh, turn marker. Um, we have a couple different reference cards here um, for chapter one, two, three, and four. Um, we also have all of the different status counters, which we'll put out once we clear this out of the way. And then we actually have um, the status counters themselves that are going to go on the statuses. So um, the way the game is going to work, characters are going to draft a team of three in standard play uh, from chapters two to four. And if you're in a team, then you're going to draft um, a team of four. But we're just going to go over standard play for chapters two to three and four. Players are going to take turns drafting characters. Uh, once they draft their characters, they're going to get their rings and put it on for which color they are. They're also going to get their uh, character sheets and their character decks. Um, so the way drafting is going to work is um, we'll say this is blue team over here and this is red team. Red team is going to draft first, so they're going to choose one character put it on their team, and then the blue player is then going to take two picks. So they're going to go ahead and take these two. Then it's going to go back to red team, and they're going to go ahead and take um, Gaston and uh, Sully. And then the blue player will get the last pick, and they're going to go ahead and take Mickey. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and set the game up and come back. Okay, so we've gone ahead and set up each player area with their player reference card, um, their character sheets, their character standees, and also their um, turn order trackers. And they've taken each of the decks from their three characters, and they're going to go ahead and shuffle those up and mix them together. We're not going to do a great job of it here. Um, other The other players done the same thing. They mix up their decks. The way player order is determined is by these little character markers here, okay? Um, there's three bits of information on here. Um, you have their life total, their point value, and this number down here is their initiative. And the initiative value is actually what's gonna determine first player, okay? So uh, the each player is going to take their little character markers and they're going to secretly put them in an order. Right, whichever one is on top is what they are considering their first um, character. So they're going to go ahead and compare these values, and whoever has the lower value is going to go first. Once they've figured out who's going to go first, they're going to place their characters down so that their initiative goes from. Um, so their initiatives actually touch each other like so, okay? And you just put them down in the order that you have uh, had them selected in your hand. And this is the first player marker. It is going to go here to determine whose turn it is um, each round. So a round consists of um, each character taking a turn and when it gets to the end, it goes back to the beginning round. Once turn order has been established, Players are then going to take turns placing their figures out onto the map. Um, these five blue spots here and these five blue spots here are the starting places um, for various points in the game. At the beginning of the game, they need to 
um, start in any five of these space or any one of these five spaces. Okay, so um, you would take turns going back and forth, um, placing characters out on the map where you want them. And then the game can begin. If you notice, uh, we've taken the uh, team markers and put them on our standees and lined them up with the health total on the bottom uh, of the standee. And throughout the game, as you take damage, you're just going to um, move this down and clip it back into place. It has these little gears so that it will stay locked into place once you clip it in. Okay. So um, throughout the game, um, when characters get KO'd, they're going to come back to the game. And when they come back into the game, they can actually start on any one of these three darker blue spots on either side of the board. So the point of the game is to get 20 points. The way you get points in this game is by knocking characters out. And uh, when you knock a character out, you'll get their awarded, awarded point value. And the other way to get points is to stay on one of these gold spots for an entire round of the game. So if Soli is able to make it from his turn all the way back around to his turn again, he would gain a victory point for standing here. Each character has their own set of skills and um, special actions that they can take along with their deck. Um, most characters have a standard move of two and a standard attack of two. However, some characters actually have um, additional movement or less movement um, based on these numbers here. So if we take a look at Soli, um, this says how many cards he gets to draw. This is his health again, this is his point total, and then this is his standard move and his actions. If we go ahead and take a look at um, Dr. Facilier, he can actually draw more cards and his attack is lowered. So the way the card draw works is you take a look at your entire team value, so you look here, two, one, and two, and that's how many cards you're allowed to have per turn. Same thing goes for the other team. If you look, they're gonna have a card advantage because they have two, four, seven cards that they can have in their hand. This is their hand limit. This team over here only has a hand limit of one, three, four, five. So it's a big difference. They're going to have less cards to work with during their turn, but some of the drawbacks are going to be lower movement versus um, faster movement and higher attack power on certain characters. Okay, um, The way the game is played um, on your turn, you can um, play a card for a particular character and do what it says. So in this case, um, Sully would be able to deal two damage to each adjacent rival. So if he was standing here and you played this card, you could deal two damage to each of these characters. If Dr. Facilier was here, he would be able to swipe all three characters and deal two damage to each character. Okay. Um, depending on which mode you're in, uh, which chapter you're in, some of your cards can be discarded to do different things. You could just discard this card to gain an extra attack power on your standard punch. So if you discarded this card, instead of being two, you would get three damage. Let's go ahead and take a look at the statuses. Okay. Um, if you notice, there are blue statuses and brown statuses. The blue statuses are uh, constant effects that are always in effect every single turn uh, during the round while the status is on the character. The brown ones are actually triggered effects and they happen at specific times, typically at the beginning of the turn, but some cards may allow you to trigger these at different points during the round. So characters are going to be able to um, place statuses on themselves, on their friends and on rivals. So let's just go ahead and take a look at Dr. Facilier's card. It says, each adjacent rival gains two cursed, then takes one damage for each different status effect on them. So the way this is going to work, he's adjacent to all three of the enemies. So he's going to go ahead and put a curse on each of his rival characters. And then because it says he's going to get two cursed, each one is going to take two 
status markers on the status effect. Now it's Dr. Facilier's turn right now. So whenever his turn is over and it goes to Sully's turn, at the beginning of his turn, he's gonna check for this effect. He's gonna do what the cursed effect says and then he's gonna remove a status counter. Okay, so as the turns go, the same thing would happen for Demona. And then as you got back around to Gaston, same thing would happen. Once it get back to Soli's turn again, he would take the last curse token off and then remove the cursed. Okay, so all of these effects are uh, spelled out in the game and they explain exactly what they do. But the actual way that they um, statuses work with the status counters are all the same. You're going to get counters based on the number and that's how many rounds essentially that's going to be in effect. So there's a few other things to pay attention to depending on which chapter of the game you're playing. Um, in chapter two, you're only going to have uh, a movement and an action phase. In chapter three, you're going to gain access to this skills phase. Um, so during your turn, you'll have movement, action, and then you can perform your skill if it's applicable. Now, you can do those in any order you want. Um, it doesn't matter, but you can't break them up. So you couldn't do one movement and then do another, do an action and then one movement. You're going to do everything together. Um, once you get into chapter four, you're actually going to gain access to this down here. Now, this is their special action um, and you will be able to upgrade it um, based on these little gear symbols down here. So if we go ahead and take a look at the cards, you're going to notice down here in the corner, you're going to have gears. So these gears line up with these gears that are required. And these cards uh, all give you the amount of gears that are in each character's deck. So in order to upgrade solely and get access to his devoted protector, you're going to need to have two of these green ones, which he only has one of in his deck. And you're going to need two of these little star ones, which he does have two of those in his deck. So if you take a look at your other characters, that's going to help you decide um, who to pick to build your team. So Gaston is going to have five of those in his deck. It's really going to help Sully out getting those. And then if you take a look, Demona um, has five of the little stars. So again, it's going to help solely be able to unlock his ability. So the way that those work, as your cards build up in your uh, discard pile, you want to keep those cards separate so that you can see which gears you have access to and how many of them you have. Because once you have the required gears, you can just turn these in, you banish these cards, they're gone, and then you can upgrade the character who they matched. Once they're upgraded, you now have access to this upgraded power. So that is the basic overview of how Disney Sorcerer's Reina Epic Alliance plays. It is a skirmish slash King of the Hill game, and you are going to play until someone reaches 20 victory points. Once one player reaches 20 points, that does trigger the end of game, and the game will continue until that round is finished. Once the round is finished, Whoever has the most points wins. So that is Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. Let's head back up and see what I thought of the game. Okay, so now that you have an understanding of how the game plays, let's go ahead and get into some of my likes and dislikes about it. Now, normally the format is, you know, we all kind of go around the table and say a thing we liked and a thing we didn't like. Um, but since it's just me, I'm gonna go ahead and give a couple likes and a couple dislikes um, and just kind of give you my overall thoughts. So. Um, first off, the things I really like about Disney Sorcerer's Arena, um, I think the biggest thing um, that I'm a fan of in this game is the chapter system. So um, if you're familiar with um, Harry Potter Hogwarts, uh, the deck builder game, um, they did something similar in that where they had, um, as the game progressed, they introduced the new concepts and new uh, mechanics as the game moved on. Um, and it, it kind of built on itself. Disney Sorcerer's Arena does something similar. There are four chapters, and these don't necessarily um, build on top of each other in the same way. Instead, what they are are essentially four levels to the game. But if you play them in order, they will ease you into getting you comfortable with the core mechanics of the game and then giving you one extra thing to do um, 
until you get to the final uh, chapter four, which gives you access to all of the abilities and skills in the game. So in a chapter one game, you get um, basically two preset teams. You're only gonna use very basic uh, move and attack and using the cards. Once you get into chapter two, on that point, you're gonna go ahead and start doing full um, three player teams and you're gonna start doing drafting where you pick whatever teams you want. Um, once you get into chapter three, they're going to build on that again, and you're going to have access to um, an extra phase of the game. So you have your movement phase, your action phase, and then the new phase, which is the skills phase. And every character has a different skill down on the bottom of their card. Um, and those can really make certain characters shine. Um, and then once you get into chapter four, this is where the gloves are off and you're going to do everything that the game has built in. Um, you're going to have the movement phase, the action phase, the skills phase, but you're also going to start taking advantage of those gears in order to gain access to special abilities for each character by upgrading them. Okay. Um, and I think that's really where the game shines. And again, you don't have to play them in order. You can jump right into the final chapter four if you want a deeper game right off the bat. But the reason why I really like this is not only does it ease players in, um, and let's be honest, this this is the Disney Sorcerer's Arena, so it's, it's going to automatically grab a certain um, set of people just based off of the IP alone. They're going to see Disney, and they're going to see, you know, Soli on the cover and Gaston, and they're going to be like, this is, this is a cool family game. And it can be. However, once you start getting those extra chapters, it really gets into becoming like a gamer's game. There's deep strategy going on there. So I really like that. You can pick and choose what level you want to play at. So if you are playing with, you know, your very strategic, heavy gamer friends, you can go ahead and jump into chapter four. If you're playing with younger players or maybe casual players that aren't really into hobby games, and this is kind of an entry, you can stick with chapter two where you just, you know, you pick your teams and you use the very basic abilities of the uh, characters. So there's a, there's a wide range of different play styles you can do. So you can, as a hardcore gamer, you can take this and play it with younger players or casual gamers or other hardcore gamers and get a different experience and you can kind of tailor it. So this one doesn't have to sit on your shelf and say, well, I can't pull this out because I'm playing with X, Y, or Z. You can play it with different people. You can play with X, Y, and Z all in different times and places or all together. You can try different variations. So that's one of the things I really like about this. Um, one of the other things I really like um, on the production of this, they went with acrylic standees um, which are really cool because it allows them to have um, these uh, really awesome looking um, pieces on the board and they're front and back. So you can, you know, it gives you the sense of like a miniature, but they're fully fleshed out already. They're painted, um, they're colored in um, and they look really good. And the other thing with those uh, standees is those, the rings that you put on them, the bases, um, are the actual life total. So you don't have to track life somewhere else. You have on the base of each character, you have their life total and those little stands, uh, the little uh, rings you put on them, you can keep track of your life. And that's how you keep track of your life total. So you can like, glance at the board and see exactly who's at what life. You don't have to go checking off onto the side or look at your different character sheets. You can just look at the board and concentrate on the board and see who's where. And I really like that. It's a, a really nice little touch they did to kind of incorporate it all into one. Um, that's always something I really wanted to see in a lot of games because it's sometimes you have to use like a, a D20 and have like a turn down counter or you put little little uh, bits on things and you can accidentally hit them and knock them around and then you don't realize what, you know, remember what your character was at. So that's a really nice little touch and it's very, um, it's very clever. It's, it's a very ingenious touch that they did there. Um, I like that. Um, one of the other things I really like about this game is um, it's kind of tied into the chapter system, which is the, um, the strategy that's in there. Once you get into the later chapters, you can like chapter four um, and even to an extent chapter three, you can really start doing all these kind of like, um, you know, 
team brewing and, you know, figuring out who's going to match with who and, and really, um, you know, theory crafting your teams. And there, there is a lot of strategic depth for someone who maybe plays magic or, um, other more complex card games. There is like Marvel champions. There is this kind of theory crafting that you can do, um, in the game. So don't let the Disney IP on it fool you. This, this does have some deep, deep strategic, uh, roots and, um, me- mechanisms that are in there to take advantage of. Um, so you can have a really good time theory crafting different teams. Um, so let's, Let's move on to a couple of things I didn't like. Um, as, as much as I really like the production of the game, one of my gripes with the game is, um, if you saw my unboxing video, um, I had a little bit of trouble figuring out where stuff was supposed to go back into the insert. Um, the insert has, you know, wells for the games that you, or for the cards. So you put them on their side and um, you, it, it holds each deck of card, uh, each, each character deck of cards, right? Um, and then there's just two other kind of wells that um, you're supposed to put stuff in. So there's not really a good place once you get those characters together. There's not a good place to just keep them on their standees in there. You kind of have to take them apart every time. Um, and there's just not a really good, to me, it's not a really good layout. And they've already announced um, two expansions for this game. Um, and there's really no room to put the expansions in. I imagine um, if you're going to get expansions for this, if you really like the game and are you going to start buying the those two expansions and maybe if they have more if if you know it does well and they start doing more you're you're probably gonna have to toss the insert and kind of do it yourself and i imagine it's just gonna open up on the secondary market and just have um all these companies that make inserts to try and you know make a better uh, a better fit for the components because there's a lot of room in here to store the stuff it's just that insert kind of leaves a, a bit to be desired for for me um one of the other things I don't like about the production value, um, the character cards, um, they're basically just terror-sized cards. I kind of wish that those character uh, cards, uh, the, the big ones that you know have all your stats and everything, I kind of wish those were a, a thicker, heavier um, poster board or you know a thin cardboard or something, something thicker than just cardstock because they do feel a little flimsy, and I'm not a I'm not a really big fan of those. They're, they're just, I feel like they, they, they could be a little bit better, um, just better quality. Um, that kind of is on the, the, the production. Um, those were my only two real nitpicks and they're not even that bad because the, the, you know, the, the, the player cards themselves, the character cards aren't terrible. Um, they're not a deal breaker by any means. I just kind of wish there was something slightly, slightly better, um, than just card stock, but, it is what it is. I think it's fine. Um, one of my other one of my other uh, gripes with the game it it, it falls back into um, the theory crafting and and how some of the characters work um, tied into with the chapter system. So if I kind of expand on that, um, certain characters are going to shine once you get into chapter four, and some characters will shine in chapter two, and they'll kind of lose their luster as you get into the higher chapters. Um, the reason for this is some of the characters' abilities and um, uh, skill make up for some of the things that they lack in the earlier chapters. So in chapter two, someone like Dr. Facilier, um, he's not really going to have a lot of synergy, and he's not going to feel really good. He's not going to feel like he's doing a whole lot on the team. His cards are fine, but when he really shines is when you can take advantage of his skill, which is to flip a card over. And if it's a magic card, you get to take an extra action. That is huge. Being able to take extra actions. There's, there's certain combos where you can get more than even two actions with Dr. Facilier. And that is, that is amazing because that's just giving you board control. Um, on the flip side, there's other characters that shine early on because their cards are really powerful. And as they move into the later game, they don't feel like they scale up as much. So as Dr. Facilier feels really weak in the early game, at early chapters, in the late chapters, he feels almost too powerful. Um, and, and that 
it's gonna you may not find it i kind of find the certain characters feel more balanced in certain modes than in other modes um and you know some of them, the abilities help carry them so i think by chapter four all the characters feel really good but there's not a good like escalation some of them start strong and just kind of stay level and other ones start weaker and get stronger throughout um and those abilities and skills kind of bring them in and then uh bring them up on onto the next level so if you have a favorite character in chapter four if you go back and play chapter two you may not like them as much or vice versa um that being said there there are a few card combinations that that do kind of play on feel bad moments um so just be aware of that with younger players dr facilier in particular specializes in locking characters down and making you lose cards from your hand uh from your opponent's hand um so that can be that can cause feel bad moments um whereas a lot of characters have feel good moments for the player that's controlling the character when they do big things and they do really big cool moves it makes you feel good and some of the characters some of their abilities just they don't make you feel as good as much as they make the other player feel bad um so there there is some of that to to watch out for with maybe younger players or people who aren't as um skilled casual gamers that they may not get it and feel that certain characters are more powerful or aren't fair um it, the game is really balanced but there sometimes uh perception is greater than reality so those are kind of my uh likes and dislikes overall i really like disney sorcerer's arena um, i'm not a big fan of skirmish games i do like how this one works i like the ip that's on here um, and if you look at some of the uh, expansions that are coming out um, they have some really cool characters in there um, that are that are in the next two sets that they've shown off so um, that is my thoughts on disney sorcerer's arena um, let us know in the comments have you played it um, what you think i was a play tester on this um, for better part of a year um so i i know i do know a lot of the ins and outs and i saw it when it was early on and and you know as it grew um but i don't really think that factors into my judgment of the game overall i wouldn't have picked it up if i didn't like it um and i do like it and uh i really like to hear your comments what you think if you have any questions let me know i like i said i was a play tester for about a year so i do have a lot of answers and insight into the game so let us know in the comments as always make sure to uh, like share subscribe help us grow the channel so we can bring you more content don't forget to check the description for our discord link come join us on discord and have a chat ask us questions in there berate us tell us what you want to see we have a, a video requests channel so you can request things that you'd like to see that maybe we haven't thought of yet or that we haven't gotten to um, let us know. Thanks again for watching. See you next time.